This is lecture 16, I'm going to be talking about sustainable real estate and some preliminary ideas that I'm working out for a course I'm going to be teaching this spring at UCLA. And in these lectures on sustainable real estate, I'm going to write about, going to deliver about eight of these, uh, as you will see, I'm going to discuss the topics below. So think of the place where you live. Think of the place where you work. Both residential and commercial buildings are major consumers of electricity. So when we think about green capitalism, it comes back to supply and demand. Do those who demand residential real estate, such as homeowners and renters, do they have any incentive to demand that their home be green or that their apartment be green? Green in terms of low electricity use and low water use. Any incentives they have to economize on these scarce resources. Turning to law firms and other and other businesses that locate in commercial real estate, do commercial real estate owners and renters have any incentive to demand green commercial space? So on the demand side for both the residential and commercial sector, does anyone have an incentive to demand green space? And of course, demand creates supply. Future Don Trumps on the real estate supply side will be more likely to produce environmentally friendly real estate if there's a demand there. Now, from classic welfare economics, if there are externalities involved in a market, then even to a Chicago economist, there might be a justification for government to get involved with state and federal policies. So what are those policies uh, and what are their intended and unintended consequences? And if all of the points come true on this slide, could, could the efforts to build the green real estate sector really have a significant environmental impact? Could we have reduced uh, climate change impacts and more resilient capital stock if this green agenda were pursued? So in joint work with Niels Koch and with John Quigley from UC Berkeley, we've been working on commercial building electricity consumption. And in this graph, I just want to show you a little bit of evidence that uh, buildings, both in the U United States and in California, that buildings are major consumers of electricity. So if you read this, in the present, buildings, residential and commercial buildings, are consuming about 70% of electricity in, in the U.S. Uh, industry is the main, industrial activity is the main missing category here. But residential and commercial buildings are consuming a huge amount of electricity, since electricity still comes mostly from fossil fuels. Uh, both coal and natural gas, there are environmental implications from this electricity consumption. They, from a sustainability standpoint, we'd be much less concerned about electricity consumption if it was all produced with zero emission stuff like solar and wind. But we don't live in that world, so there are environmental externalities associated with energy consumption, and buildings are major consumers. And here's just another picture showing the importance of the commercial building sector. And uh, it, 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 Commercial buildings, uh, where you shop, where you work, are a major component here. So, in the spring, in the spring in 2013, I'm going to be teaching a new course at UCLA's Anderson School of Management. This is going to be an elective for MBAs, and I hope that it will attract students from other parts of UCLA. In the past, uh, students from architecture, law, public policy, urban planning, and economics have all attended my lectures for reasons I can't explain. This course has the bad title, Real Estate Investment and the Development of Sustainable Cities. I want to give you a preview as I continue to think about how to structure this course. So we're going to start the course, and all of this is subject to change, but this, uh, these eight topics I'm going to show you today highlight the next eight video lectures I'm going to give. In topic number one, we're going to focus on what is a sustainable city. So I'm still learning what the word sustainability means, and we've got to figure this out. Topic number two, we're going to talk about the critical issue of real estate pricing. And is it the case that those cities with high quality of life, a, those cities where you see uh, sustainability patterns, are the entrepreneurs in those cities rewarded with higher real estate prices, a higher return on their investment? In topic three, we're going to focus on the demand side. Uh, there's a lot of talk in urban planning and architecture about new urbanism, both in terms of architecture and community design. Uh, new urbanism is sort of the, the opposite of sprawl. Uh, High-density homes uh, in where it's a walkable community and public transit rather than the car is the norm. 
And if you bundle that with green energy efficient homes, who demands? Is this a niche product? Who demands these homes? What evidence is there that there's a real market for this given current electricity prices? In topic four, it's sort of a twin of topic three, we're going to turn to the commercial side of the economy for, for commercial, for both uh, renters and uh, long-term tenants, whether it's Walmart or whether it's a law firm or a computer programming firm, what's their demand for locating in a green office building or in a structure that's energy efficient? Who demands to be in these Energy Star and LEED buildings? And how much of a rent premium are they willing to pay? That segues naturally into topic number five, development opportunities in green design for new construction and retrofits. So there's plenty of energy inefficiency in our economy in an age of durable capital. I'm looking up and down my street at homes built in the 1940s and 50s, and many of them are highly energy inefficient. When would a real estate developer purchase the house and do a, a complete makeover of the house to make it more energy efficient? And when would he earn a rate of return for that investment? And for those who engage in new development, especially in the developing world and in the suburbs. What incentives do they have to build energy efficient housing stock and commercial stock that will last for decades? Going to talk at length in topic six about synergies between private and public investment. So in Beijing, they're building subways. You build downtown subways that take you to the center city. How does the private sector respond to these public investments? Does this increase the likelihood of building downtown uh, malls and other investments that make the center city stronger and the metropolitan area more sustainable? Topic seven, we're gonna talk about local land use regulation, an important topic in California, of what we allow land to be used for and not for and why and what are the unintended consequences. In topic eight, we're gonna talk about policies, whether it's a carbon tax or California's AB 32, that encourage green real estate investment. When investors anticipate what government's gonna do and its rules of the game, how does the private sector respond? So in my next eight lectures, I'm going to build on each of these themes and talk about these at length. For those who are interested in the applied econometrics, which we don't do much of that in these simple lectures, I encourage you to go to my friend Niels Koch's webpage, www.nielscoke.com, for many technical details about some of the issues we're going to be talking about.